to see some of you here. Maybe some other people will trickle in or, I mean, these are also recorded. So if you just end up watching this video later on, that's fine as well. Oh, wow. I hope you've all been doing well. Um, I miss all of my English 10 folk, obviously. I mean, I miss all my students, clearly. But also English 10, like, I really feel like this semester, we were gonna start doing some really cool projects. Like we did that Black History Month club project, for example. And I had this super cool idea actually for um, our current unit, Night and the Holocaust and Hate and Bias and things like that. But unfortunately, those ideas are not going to work out. Maybe I'll still like offer it up to some of you next year though, when I'm doing the project. Just because again, I think it's a really cool project. And maybe I'll talk about the project someday. Not today though. Um, so for those of you who are in my English 10 class, I'm gonna get signed into my buzz really quick. Just so that way we could take a look at the assignment that I put in there to finish up unit two. Voila, let me switch my screens over. Boom. Oh my gosh, 74 things need grading. That's so much. So I'll just take a look at second block, for example. My office hour schedule. So finishing up unit two, really the only thing that I told all of you to do was finish reading the book Night if you haven't finished it. And the link to all of the audio is up here on the buzz. So you can listen to it, you can read it at the same time. The reason why I really like these videos is because they actually record themselves reading what the text on the screen at the same time. And then the other thing was the night discussion. So this was all about unpopular opinions and I specifically went to the Reddit of unpopular opinions. Oh, not that one. Oh, no, I went too far. Go forward, there it is. R slash unpopular opinion. So, on this like unpopular opinion thread, I just went through and I tried to find all the stuff that was related to hate and bias. And so that's how I ended up with these posts that were in here. So there's quite a few of them. There are like, I think there's like eight of them in total. And I guess kind of my lesson for today is just thinking, is just talking through some of like the logical fallacies behind a lot of these arguments and some of the issues with them. And then if we have some time, we can take a look at some of the other examples as well. So again, we want to be referencing the psychology of hate and also the pyramid of hate in our responses for this. And also you can use some, and also you want to reference like the book Night or some of your other examples of hate and bias from the world. Because we started doing that research right before school got canceled. So let's take a look at this first one that I have posted up. So the Holocaust is way overtaught. And you know what? Let's just go to the original post. That way we get that experience. The Holocaust is way overtaught, overused, and kind of annoying to hear about. Let me preface this by saying I understand why we learn about the Holocaust. Because it's important to... Let's zoom in some more so it's easier to read. So we should... So we should without a doubt be aware of the warning signs of something like this. Simple enough concept, just don't do it again. I suppose that by emphasizing it a stupid amount right now, it'll be a slower teaching tradition to die off completely and will prolong the overall amount of time that the Holocaust is talked about. But it's not like people are just going to stop teaching it entirely. We've only had two world wars and not many people talk about the first one. Nobody is going to deem the Holocaust to be an unnecessary subject to be taught but I'm feeling frustrated and annoyed because of how much it is currently overtaught and how much people white knight for anyone whose predecessors might have been affected by it. I've been learning about the Holocaust since I was in fourth grade and it's safe to say I get the goddamn point. But lately I've seen people talking, taking whole classes on Holocaust studies and planting gardens to honor the dead. Excuse my bluntness, but they're dead. They don't give a, 
S-H-I-T, about your stupid gardens. If you're religious and believe they're in the afterlife, they're either essentially in hell, where they're too busy to care about your flowers, or they're in some sort of heaven, where they're still too busy to care about your flowers. The only reason to do something so public would be because you're naive and just want to do good. I can respect that. <coughs> To bring yourself a good reputation slash attention so you can look better than other people, okay, you narcissistic a-hole, or to make the people relate to whoever was affected feel nice, also respectable, but you can make them feel nice in other less cliche ways that have nothing to do with sucking up to them just because of who they are slash their lineage. Granted, I understand there are Holocaust deniers and many people are driven to deny the Holocaust deniers, but there are always going to be deniers and conspiracy theories and such. There's no point in being a dead horse to the rest of us who aren't denying it or even to the ones who are because they'll only grow more bitter at someone else's ideology being forced upon them. I understand wanting to help the victims of this tragic event, but many of them are dead already or old enough it would almost seem better to leave them in peace and let them spend time alone with their families. There are so many more current victims of other things to worry about who are still alive and who can still be helped, but we're wasting our time crying over the past, which granted, the past sucks, but it's over and there's nothing more to say about it. To say about it, but to remember it. Whew, okay, that was a long one. And you know what? This is really freaking hard to read because this person does not use any paragraphs. They have a ton of run-on sentences. Their, like, their, um, their word choice is actually pretty decent, so I'm pretty impressed with their word choice. But, again, it's really hard to read because they don't capitalize any words. It's like, I don't know. And it's kind of confusing to me because like if you type anything on like a computer or like a phone, like a lot of this would just get auto-capitalized. So I don't know what kind of word processor they were using. But our purpose is not to question their writing ability. Our purpose is to actually, I don't know, come up with a reasonable argument against this. So I guess the first thing that I want to point out is how they actually, like, I guess they make a lot of assumptions in this that, that, that while, you know, there is some truth to some assumptions, but also at the same time, it's, their assumptions at the end of the day and they don't necessarily apply to every single situation or every single person. So for example, I've been learning about this since I was in the fourth grade. Yes, that might be the truth that this person lived through, but that may not be the truth for every single person. And as a matter of fact, I can definitely say that there are some curriculums around the United States even that they probably don't talk about the Holocaust ever. Uh, and that's not to say that the teachers are bad or that the schools are bad. It's just to say that like sometimes schools just really lack the resources to be able to have discussions about this kind of thing. Um, and people taking whole classes about Holocaust studies, I think that's completely fine actually. Like if you're interested in that, I think you should do it. I think that is a very valid thing to seek out and a very valid thing to do. I mean, I took a class in college about Native American linguistics and it was specific to like the genocide of Native American people and how that impacted their language growth and their language development and also and actually led to the death of many languages and so many Native American languages are just simply gone now and we'll never know about them because they were killed off in like the millions when European settlers came to the United States. Uh, and that was like going up until like literally the 1900s. So it wasn't even something that happened in like, you know, colonial times. It was like literally up until the 1900s, this was happening. Uh, and so I really don't think that you can take a crap on people who are just trying to take a class about something they're interested in. Now, this whole idea about like planting the flowers to honor the dead and things like that, um, I think that's just very culturally insensitive because first, like, first of all, it is like, like, we obviously understand that planting flowers is not for the dead person, unless that is part of your religion, where you believe that you have to leave um, offerings for a dead person. So that way they can take that to the afterlife. So 
To that regard, some cultures do believe that honoring their dead through things like flowers, through things like money, through things like uh, burnt offerings, that actually is very important to their culture. And so it's really culturally insensitive to actually, um, to like kind of take a crap on that. And at the same time, I think that people, even if you are not religious and it's not part of your religion, I don't think that the flowers are a way for, to like, I don't think the flowers are for the dead person. Like when we give flowers to a dead person or someone who has passed away, I really do think that even those of us who are not religious, we do it as a way to kind of show our love and our affection towards the person who has passed away. So again, this is just very culturally insensitive. I just think it's a very not well thought out argument at all. It just, it's a rant. Like that part of it is just a rant. This part of it, I do kind of agree with actually to a certain extent uh, because cause like, yeah, a lot of people will do things just for the public image and for the, to get that kind of like public social praise from people being like, oh my gosh, you're such a good person because you gave flowers to this person. Yeah, that's definitely a thing. So that's actually like a real argument that I think there are definitely people in the world who are going to do, you know, Holocaust remembrance just for the sake of keeping up a public image. And unfortunately, that's not something that we can control. There are plenty of people who do it not for bad reasons, and I think we should respect that. Um, and then he goes, or they go on into Holocaust denial. Yes, Holocaust denial is definitely a thing, but I don't think that bringing up the Holocaust and educating about the Holocaust is going to make Holocaust deniers like deny it stronger. I just don't think that is like the correct ideology or like the correct thought pattern that Holocaust deniers would go through. It actually seems more like we Holocaust deniers, the reason why they deny it is because they don't have the evidence and they don't have the information that tells them they should be paying more attention to this kind of stuff. So as a matter of fact, we should be doing more education as there are more Holocaust deniers than ever before. So that just like, that argument just completely falls out. Um, and then right here at the end, they just kind of like throw out that like, that hash, that like hashtag all lives matters kind of argument. And you know, I see this come up so often Anytime someone tries to bring up like any sort of social issue, like whether it be racism, Holocaust denial, uh, sexism, homophobia, like any of the social issues that come up, there's always going to be some person who's like, well, but there are so many other bigger issues. And you know what? Like that is literally one of the worst arguments you could ever make because the point about bringing awareness to some of these issues like Holocaust denial, racism, etc. The point about bringing up these arguments and bringing up these facts is not just to like, you know, it's not just to like, what are my words I'm trying to say right here? Like, it's not to push all the other social issues aside. It's to lift this one up alongside the other issues. Obviously, all lives do matter. Obviously, all social issues matter. And there are going to be times when some social issues should be more heavily focused on than others. Like for example, right now during our time of coronavirus and COVID-19, we should definitely be taking care of our more vulnerable populations, which would include those with compromised immune systems, the elderly, and also those who are have living circumstances that don't allow them to do things like self-isolate. We should be taking care of these specific people right now. So me coming out and like, and if someone were to tell me like, oh, Mr. Her, we need to take care of the elderly. And it would be a really jerk move for me to just say, well, you know, we need to take care of everyone though. Like there are other issues that are bigger than this. That's a jerk move. And so we really should not take a poo on anyone's movement because all movements do matter. And okay, now it's starting to sound like I'm saying that the all lives matter is kind of thing. All things matter. And we have to be able to encompass like all of this when we are 
propelling our own movements and also when we are participating in things. So to shut down one movement and say that that one doesn't matter because of a different movement, that just perpetuates a cycle of hatred and bias. We need to lift up all things and we need to lift up all things in different ways. Like some movements need more support than others. That's just, that's how social justice works. So that's kind of my response to this very long one. Again, I, I think this person is just going on a rant. They don't really make any real arguments throughout this. So I'm not too worried about this to be completely honest. Um, like, I don't think this person is going to go out and start an anti-Holocaust education movement. And if they were, they would be shut down pretty quickly because they don't actually have any real evidence. That's simply put. Next one. We will show less. Ooh, this one is classroom related. <gasps> this post has been deleted. Ooh, drama. You know what? This person probably deleted it because they realized that they had a really bad argument. Or, yeah. Or they just got so much hate. Um, okay, so anyways, I copy and pasted this post before it was deleted. So it's sickening and disgusting that we have to tell children about concentration camps and the horrors that happened within them. Obviously, it has to be discussed, but it really, but it can really take a mental toll on kids. In fifth grade, my teacher made us watch a documentary on the Holocaust, and I had screaming slash crying dreams of being trapped in a concentration camp. I know we had to teach it. I'm not suggesting we don't, but the vulgarity of World War II is really horrific to be telling children. Um, you know, it's if I could have a I, if I could have a sit down conversation with this person. I really just want to like dig into the reasons why they think children can't handle this kind of stuff. Now obviously there are certain things that children probably should not be exposed to. Like like children should obviously not be exposed to just piles of dead bodies because there are pictures of the Holocaust where it's literally just piles of dead bodies. And even when I show Holocaust documentaries in my high school classes, I sometimes have to take a step back and ask the, myself the question like, can I really show high schoolers this? Is this okay? And I do that same thing with everything that I teach in class where it's, is it okay that this story has, talks about suicide? Is it okay that this story talks about sexual assault? Like there are a ton of things that teacher, we as teachers have to think about anytime we introduce curriculum into our classrooms. However, that being said, there are ways of teaching young children about the horrors of the world without necessarily having to go into the nitty gritty details of the horrors of the world. And that really is what these classrooms need, is they need to be aware of these things so that way once they become older and they're able to think for themselves and they're able to make decisions, they aren't blindsided by these issues. If you were never to tell anyone, if you were never to tell a child about the Holocaust, they could go through their entire, they could go through their entire like elementary school and middle school career, never knowing anything about the horrors of World War II and why we were, well, I shouldn't say that was the reason why we were fighting. There were other major other reasons, but if we were never to, if we never included that in our education, once they get to high school, they're going to be blindsided. And actually, I would imagine it's going to be more traumatic for a high schooler to learn about something for the first time, as opposed to if we were to slowly feed it to students as they are growing up. Um, I actually see this a lot, especially when it comes to other social issues like racism. Like we go through a lot of school and not really talking about racism or talking about racism in the context of Martin Luther King Jr. fixed racism by his I have a dream speech, which we know is not the case. Racism is not fixed. And then they get to high school and they get to some of my classes where I talk about racism and how and like social justice. And they're like, wait, but Mr. Her, I thought that that was like not a thing anymore. And I'm like, oh, friend. That is still a thing. So it is super important to actually keep educating about the Holocaust. And yes, as teachers, we have to be very mindful about how we talk about it. But at the end of the day, just to ignore it would actually be doing society a huge disservice. So next one, rape jokes can actually be pretty funny. Let's go take a look at the original post. 
Yep, believe it or not, I've actually heard a lot of funny jokes about rape. Yep, I keep seeing on the media, etc., people saying that rape jokes are not funny, or it's never okay to make a rape joke. Well, what about murder jokes? Murder is 10 times worse, yet jokes about killing people are everywhere, and I don't hear people complaining about that. You can make a good joke on literally any topic if your wrong version of your, if you're good enough, and rape is no exception. Um, you know what? There are just, I feel like this post is from, I feel like the person who wrote this post is like, oh, I feel like this person is like trying to, I don't know, champion something that they don't understand enough about. Like, it really is just someone sitting behind the safety of their computer screen and just they don't understand the true issue of rape and sexual assault and they don't understand the context of it. And I think like this is an issue we actually see come across a lot in not just um, in not just like which you call it and not just issues with rape but also just with like social issues in general where a lot of comedians are being asked like is it okay for you to actually make that joke in 2020 and you know what my answer would be is no for a lot of comedians they just they shouldn't be making these kinds of jokes in 2020 maybe in 2010 or 2000 or like in the 1900s this kind of stuff might have been okay but guess what? Society has changed. People have changed. Rape is not a laughing matter anymore. Um, and we just have to be better as people. We have to be better. And yes, being a better person, being a better society, means that we have to let go of some of these things that we may have found funny in the past, like rape making rape jokes. That may have been funny in the past, but we have to be better now. We just simply have to be. That means you have to give up a part of what you may have found fun in the past. Uh, something that recently, or something that I can definitely say I've seen change across the span of my own life, I'm 24 years old, is that like jokes about, um, Jokes about like the mentally disabled and neurodiverse people and physically diverse people, like those jokes used to be so normal when I was a kid, especially jokes about neurodiverse people and mentally disabled people, uh, like literally comedians like mocking mentally um, mentally disabled people, like having full characters and full skits where they pretend to be mentally disabled and you know do really awful things and present it in a really awful way. And that used to be normal. Like I remember watching comedy specials when I was younger and that was just the norm for people to, to do that and participate in that. And nowadays that is like, that's not okay. You can't do that. Like, if a comedian were to mock a mentally disabled person, that would be, like, that would be the end of their career. Right there. Like, the end. Uh, President Trump, at one point, actually mocked a, what he believed to be a disabled reporter, and I'm surprised that he didn't get more backlash for that, honestly. Because it was, like, really offensive. Uh, yeah. So, rape jokes, they may have been funny in the past, you yourself may have laughed at some of them in the past, but in 2020, not okay anymore. And again, that's just because society is changing. Rape is no longer, like, with rape becoming a bigger issue and it's affecting more people, you just can't make jokes about it anymore. Or if you are going to make jokes about it, you just have to be, I don't know, you have to, it has to be in good flavor. Like, maybe instead of making a rape joke, you make a joke about the... About, you make a joke about, like, rape culture and about how it's become so normalized. Or you make a satirical joke about um, all of these specifically, like, white men, white straight men who have basically walked away from rape and sexual assault charges. So there are other places to make jokes. But to make jokes about, like, victims of rape, I just... I just don't know why you would want to do that and why you would want to participate in that. It just doesn't really make sense to me. 
But again, I'm not like, I consider myself a reasonable person who doesn't want to make rape jokes, so I can't really relate to this person. Coming up next, we have racism isn't as prevalent in America as people think. So it really isn't. All it is is the media hyping up a few cases of racism to get more views. All this does is create fear in the public most people don't give a damn about skin color. Don't get me wrong, there are still shitty hate groups out there like neo-Nazi parties, the KKK, and Antifa. And then that's an edit that they have probably after the fact, after people started commenting and stuff. So it says, a lot of commenters are stating they that they know of racism. Yes, racism exists. The point of this post is that racism is not as prevalent in America as the media portray portraits it. Not that it simply doesn't exist. That would be an outrageous claim. Um, so this is like, this is again another one of those things that I see come up in a lot of arguments is that a lot of people will try to pin the blame of social issues or like, they will blame media for inflating social issues. And I really don't think that this is as much of an issue as people think that it is. Because if you think about how many, if you think about how many crimes go on, like, first of all, how many crimes don't get caught? and how many crimes don't get reported, then the number is probably actually, like the things that we see in the news and the media is probably actually only a fraction of what is actually happening in the world. Uh, I can definitely say, for example, like microaggressions where, you know, it's not necessarily outwardly racist of like, you know, calling a black person the N word. Um, but at the same time, making like, a snide remark about someone's race or making a like making an underhanded comment about someone's race like those microaggressions really do build up and so that is an example of racism that is still very much alive but doesn't get captured by the media because again a lot of this like i can't call the cops on someone who calls me chinese even though i'm not chinese i can't call the cops on someone who like outwardly uses the n-word like that's not really something that i can call the cops about unless they are unless they're using it in a way that is like impacting other people around them to such a negative degree that they have to be like contained so yeah so this whole idea of like the media just over reporting racism is it's not that's not a real thing there are certain cases that definitely do get overreported, uh, and that's just because, like, if those cases blow up, then every news media outlet wants to cover them. But there are so many things that don't get reported at the same time that I just don't think this argument holds up. And I don't have the evidence or the research. I'm sure we could find some research to prove that, uh, or to like look at like how many race hate crimes don't get reported on a yearly basis. But yeah, again, it doesn't really hold up. Ooh, this one is an interesting one. So this one says, the best way to end racism slash racial tension is to stop talking about it. Parentheses, seriously. Morgan Freeman said it first, uh, but I find this to be true. My anecdotal experience as a white kid growing up in the inner city has shaped my view of this topic. I was the only white kid in my high school basketball team, one of the three on my soccer team. I never had any issue getting along with my minority classmates slash teammates. We never had racial tension or saw serious racism at work. To be honest, we made racist jokes all the time. Not because we thought, not because we thought it, but really because we thought it was such an absurd idea. American media and politics is throwing racism around currently to just build up their parties and make their candidates look better, better than the other. These inflammatory statements in turn just like, just like up the whole country. Oh, I think that's a typo. I know it existed and still exists somewhat and the history should be talked and learned about, but people need to stop being so accusatory if they want to see racism diminish. So I don't really know what this person's argument is like, most of their argument is built upon their anecdotal evidence. Like, okay, take a look at that. I would say that's about half. 
Half of this person's post is anecdotal evidence, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. You can definitely use anecdotal evidence as your evidence to back up an argument. However, at the end of the day, it doesn't... Your anecdotal evidence does not speak for every single person in the United States, let alone every single person in the world. That being said, this person also admits that they are a white kid growing up in an inner city. And being a, like, this person really needs to acknowledge their own race before they start talking about issues like racism. And that many white people have not, like, historically have not faced racism to the same degree as, say, like, a black person, a Latinx person, etc. And that's just a social privilege that exists. It doesn't make you a bad person for not having experienced racism. In fact, it's probably a good thing that you haven't experienced racism. But also, this person needs to, they need to acknowledge that about themselves, that they, they themselves may not have experienced racism to the same degree or in the same way that many people of America have. That's not to say they haven't experienced racism at all, because, I mean, I'm sure there can definitely be examples of that. Um, we never saw had racial tension or saw r serious racism at work. Again, that I really challenge this person to think about that critically and think about that from the experience of from the experience of people of color specifically in America. Because again, as if you were a white person, you are not going to face that direct racism. Like you're not going to have people, like when you're walking down the street, more, more likely than not, you're not gonna have people cross the street to avoid you, or you're not going to have people make certain assumptions about you simply because white is seen as the normal in America right now. So again, like this anecdotal evidence is it comes from one perspective. Had they done some research and maybe talked to some people of color about this, I would maybe feel a little bit more comfortable about this argument. But again, because it's just themselves, I don't really think that the argument stands that well. Um, and then here's that whole idea about the news again. So American media and politics is throwing racism around currently to just build up their parties and make their candidates look better than the other. I actually kind of agree with that statement. I think racism can definitely be used as a platform that politicians can use to improve themselves. To be like, oh, look how woke I am. Like, I am so, like, I'm so anti-racist. I'm so woke. Um... Something that I don't see very many politicians do, though, is actually acknowledge their own privileges that they've had growing up and also their privileges as politicians. Because, I mean, like, being a politician, you're pretty, you're pretty wealthy. <laughs> like, first of all, you have to be pretty wealthy to become a politician because it basically becomes your full-time job while you're running for office. And so you need a decent, like, you need a decent donation like backing to actually make that work because your living expenses don't go away etc so even just to become a politician and to consider running you have to have a decent amount of money already and i see so many politicians trying to be like oh i am like every other person of america like i know what it means to be a working class person i'm like yeah you may have had that experience but also when you became a politician you kind of gave up that life like you you are no longer a working class person once you become a politician. Um, people need to stop being so accusatory if they want to see racism diminish. I don't really know what this person is trying to say by that. Like, are they trying to say that we need to just stop talking about racism to see racism diminish? Because I don't think that's ever going to make the issue go away. That's like saying like, oh, I have this really bad rash and you know what, I'm just going to, I'm just going to wait for it to go away. And yeah, it might go away by itself. But also, if you're anything like me, I have eczema, and if I do nothing to eczema, it literally stay, it can stay there for months. And I have a steroid cream that I have to put on my eczema patches, so that way they actually go away. So yeah, sometimes things might go away by chance, but more often than not, they're not going to. So if we just continue to be silent and do nothing about this, nothing is going to happen. 
And I mean, we see the same thing, exact thing happen actually in the Holocaust where people stay, people were silenced for so much of the Holocaust. And many people, while they didn't know the extent of the concentration camps, they knew that the camps were, pro they knew something was happening behind the scenes and they knew Hitler was doing something problematic. However, so many people just stayed silent that nothing actually was done for these, for this. And then millions of people died because of that. So yes, this is a slow burn issue right here that we have to continue acknowledging if we actually want to address it. We cannot just ignore it. Oh God, one of my neighbors is smoking outside and it smells really bad. Ooh, what about sexism? So the disparity between men and women in STEM isn't due to sexism. Stop acting like you're morally superior because you're on an all-girls robotics team or something like Girls Who Code. The fact that there are less women than men in STEM isn't because women are being excluded from STEM fields because of sexism. Women just aren't choosing to go into STEM fields. In college, women overwhelmingly choose non-STEM fields and men choose mostly STEM-related fields. And this isn't because of stupid sexist gender stereotypes that says boys play with cars and women play with dolls. It's because of the chemical differences in men's and women's brains that show that men are better at analyzing things and women are better at empathizing. Wow. I think it's funny that this is, that this has become archived and people can no longer comment on it. I'm guessing it's because so many people were like arguing on it that it just had to be closed. Um, well, there are a lot of logical fallacies in this, in this right here. First and foremost, this like whole thing with the chemical difference, um, there is no, there is no like science that says that, you know, male brains are better at analysis and female brains are better at empathy. There's, there are trends and there can be trends they haven't concluded that male brains just automatically analyze better and female brains automatically empathize better. Like that's not a thing. So that's just some like pseudoscience right there made up to try to improve this person's argument. Um, and when this person brings up like the sexist gender stereotypes, that actually is where the issue is coming from. It's that from a very young age, like, many girls are not encouraged to go into fields that require things like analysis, that require things like STEM skills. Uh, and you can even see that in the toys that are bought. Like many boys are bought Legos, for example, and girls that are bought toys that are typically don't require that kind of like ingenuity or that kind of building skill. And so from even like the youngest age, people are starting to differentiate like boys get to do this kind of thing where they get to use their creative skills, which we know actually really helps children to play with Legos, to play with things that force them to be creative and to create new things. And girls are given more of like the, oh, take care of the doll, play house, you know, work in the kitchen, pretend to work in the kitchen. So it is a very gendered thing starting from literally day one of birth. And I would say that if we were to raise boys and girls in like, if we were to raise probably a bunch of boys and a bunch of girls and a bunch of, you know, non-gender conforming children in a, in a room where they just had Legos all the time, I bet a lot of them would probably go into STEM. Like, if they so chose. And that's just simply because like, again, your upbringing has such a big impact on like what you're interested in and Kind of what kind of skills you develop as you grow up. So it is sexism as to why men and women, as to why there's such a disproportionate number of men in STEM compared to women. It's just that it's sexism starting at such a young age and it's so socialized into us that we don't notice it anymore. Ooh, this is an interesting one. Opinion, there's bigger issues in the world than homophobia and we don't need a parade and a whole month for gay people. In North America, we have huge parades for gay awareness and gay pride. There's bigger issues like sexual assault, racism, and abuse. 
more awareness should be directed towards those issues. Edit. I'm not saying that there is no place for these parades and events, but if these exist, there should also be awareness raised for other issues. Again, this is one of those times where I'm just like, I don't really know what kind of argument you're trying to make, friend. Yes, sexual assault, racism, and abuse all matter, but you cannot use those as as supports for trying to push down another social issue. Like again, you cannot play the oppression Olympics when it comes to social issues. Nobody wins in the oppression Olympics and we should not try, so we shouldn't even try to play the oppression Olympics. It's just not useful. It's not beneficial to anyone. Um, the reason why we have pride parades is like, I mean, by and large part, it actually has to do with the political movements around LGBT rights in America, where in the 40s, in the 40s and the 50s, when LG, in the height of the both like the rise of the AIDS crisis and also the, um, I guess the rise of like people being out and proud, like as more people were becoming out and proud, there were also people who were trying to get like political gains for LGBT folk because for a very long time, it was not legal for LGBT folk to get married because again, marriage was defined only between a man and a woman or the legal version of marriage was only defined as a man and a woman. And so when these leaders were rising up to, um, when these leaders were rising up to actually what is it, to take a stand against this injustice, they started riots. And that's where like, for example, the Stonewall riots come from. And those riots, they would just take people and go out and peacefully walk the streets and to make a stance saying that like, LGBT people, we are real, we are here, we exist. And that is what the parade really symbolizes and what the parade represents is it's not just gay people like going out and like throwing confetti and glitter into the air because because we like confetti and glitter. It is actually remembrance to those to the people who have died. So that way people in 2020 could have rights and people in 2020 can love who we want to love. So this person really doesn't understand the history of the Pride Parade or the history of the LGBTQ plus community. And for those reasons, I really want to challenge this person to actually better understand the issue before they form an opinion about it. Because again, this opinion just isn't backed up by evidence and it's not backed up even by proper, like, I don't know, whatever. So again, this person needs to do some research before they start doing some posts. And that's like some stuff you could pretty easily find if you do a Google search. If you just Google search like, why are there pride parades? Literally. All right, ooh, this one is about poverty. So people who live in inner city poverty slash ghettos don't actually care about their children. Obviously, that is where the majority of violent crimes and homicides happen in the US. You can't complain about fearing for your children's walking to school or to the store if you subject them to living there. Everyone says it's not that easy to just move. Why not? Realistically, the person living in poverty or the Section 8 housing either doesn't have a job or has a job requiring low skill level, which those jobs can be found anywhere in the US. Why not find a job somewhere in some podunk town in Kansas or Idaho or Montana, somewhere the cost of living is low and so is the crime rate. Your child would grow up in a safe environment and also actually get an education. Take away the option to be a gangbanger or be killed by one. All I'm saying is there are options to up there and depending on how much you care for your loved ones you'll find a way to get out so this is a huge assumption that privileged people have about specifically poor people and you know what this person definitely is not taking an intersectional look at this as well because if you were to look at like the people who are in poverty and who are living in you know, very high poverty areas of the United States, most of those people are, are people of color. In, and typically they were going to include black people, uh, Latinx people, and some Southeast Asian communities as well, but not a ton. And one of the really big issues with having this kind of like mind or thought process is that it makes the assumption that everyone, first of all, has the social ability to get out of whatever situation they're in. Um, so like, you know, I think it would be great if all of us could just pick up and move to Kansas or Idaho or some small town out there. 
But you know what? There are... I mean, I think about this for myself sometimes, where I'm like, sometimes I just want to avoid the city and I just want to move to a random town in Wisconsin. But guess what? There are random towns in Wisconsin who have never seen a person of color before. There are random towns in Wisconsin who have never seen an LGBTQ plus person before. There are random towns in Wisconsin where I'm probably not safe. There are random towns in Wisconsin that probably would not want me as a teacher simply because of my identities. Like they don't want me around their children. And you know, I don't have the ability or the capacity to just pick up and move wherever I want. I mean, that's one of the big reasons why I ended up at Middleton and why I want to stay around the Madison area is because I know that I'm not going to get shot here. <laughs> I know that sounds like really extreme, but yeah, I know someone isn't going to come knock on my door and kill me for being a person of color or being an LGBTQ plus person or being a person who just believes in the things that I believe in. Um, I mean, like, I guess something I would challenge this person to think about is, um, is like thinking about people who are in war zones, like people in Syria, for example, some parts of Syria, for example, like, could we really expect a Syrian refugee who's trying to escape war just to literally get up and move and be fine with it? Like, are we really going to tell a refugee of war that, you know, the reason why your children might die is because of you? That is so awful. That's so terrible. And that is something that is out of their control. They don't have the power. They don't have the social capital. They don't have maybe even the money to get out of that situation. So what kind of options do we have for them? We don't have options. Like if someone is living in Section 8 housing, which is housing for you know people in poverty, and they have a low level skill, they're barely surviving. Like what do you expect them to do? I'm sorry, I'm getting like kind of mad just because like people really do think this way. Oh, <sighs> okay, I'm gonna click away from this one before I like, before I have a moment, because you all know Mr. Herbie having moments. Oh my gosh, this one is super messed up. I, I have nothing to say to this one other than just like, what the hell? <laughs> we need mass genocide every now and then. It helps control the human population. Genghis Khan killed scrub 700, I don't know what that grammar is, 700 million tons of carbon from the atmosphere by allowing forests to regrow on previously populated and cultivated land. How did he achieve this? By killing the people on aforementioned land. Yeah, I don't even need to talk about this. This is just messed up. You know my reaction to this? Um, I'll show you my reaction. Um... Where's that picture? Oh wait, that's Spotify. Oh no, there's this one really, this is one picture that I, Oh, here it is. I think this is it. <laughs> yeah, that's like the same kind of... Oh, hey, John. Thanks for coming to the stream. I am judging these really bad Reddit posts about suicide and self-harm right now. Yeah, so like this kind of reasoning that we see in this mass genocide thing is like, I feel like the same kind of reasoning of saying that suicidal people are just angels that want to return to heaven. And it just makes me, uh, uh, yeah, not a thing. Highly problematic. So I'm not even gonna like break that one down. 
All right, this is the last one of the day, the last hate example of hate and bias. So hate crimes as a designation shouldn't exist. I think the designation hate crime shouldn't even be a thing. Why would it be a good idea to purposefully make the punishment for a crime arbitrary based on motivation, which would be the quote hate part of the crime that is different to prove. Just punish the crime for what it is, not to mention the fact that most, if not all, crimes are motiv motivated by some form of hate or malice. Why arbitrarily designate some forms of hate and malice as more intolerable? Example, if someone bears an unbridled hatred towards beekeepers, seeks them out and commits atrocities against them, it doesn't seem relevant to consider their prejudices as a factor in deciding punishment. And I believe the same can be said for all hate crime designations. So this doesn't really make sense. So hate crimes are... So again, hate crimes are like... Hate crimes are... Like the definition of a hate crime is a crime committed against someone based off based off of like a an identity that the victim has or some sort of other motivating factor. And the reason why we need to have a hate crime as a designation is actually to differentiate between hate crimes and also just like petty crimes that happen. So for example, if someone comes up and stabs me, but it's because they just like are going on a killing spree, it's very different than someone who comes up and stabs me because I'm Asian or because I'm LGBTQ+. Like, those are very different things and need to be treated as such. And also, like, we know that hate crimes are part of the pyramid of hate and that eventually hate crimes will lead to things like genocide if not kept under control. And so that's the reason why hate crimes do need to be part of the are part of our vocabulary is because a hate crime and a regular crime are again not the same exact thing they are different things uh this example of like beekeeping so not this specific example itself but like when people bring up these kind of like irrelevant examples and try to make them prove their point i always find it a little bit i always find it like a little bit amusing uh, especially because when it comes to something like racism and hate crimes or homophobia, sexism, etc. Because hate crimes can, hate crimes can like encompass a lot of different things. Make a scene, John. You know me. You know me, John. I'm always gonna make a scene. So when it comes to hate crimes, it is, or sorry, when it comes to like example or talking about hate crimes, there are so many examples that you could pull from that you don't need to make this outrageous example about beekeepers like you really could just google hate crimes and you will find a million and one different examples of hate crimes that already exist um oh my gosh what the heck comments get off that soapbox i'm sure you are the first guy to protest kick a ginger day as is the world's only publicly celebrated hate crime if you think about it if you try to kick a black dude day you'd literally be on the news I'm so confused by this thread. <laughs> oh my gosh. The ignorance of this site is amazing. I'm right there with you, exiled from Twitter. It is, yeah. Every other post. Wow. Oh, my definition makes sense. I thought you were telling me to make a scene, John. And you you know I do make a scene. Yeah, John, you probably remember this from last year. But yeah, my English 10 students are currently doing their project where they have to respond to hate and bias or like examples of hate and bias. And so this year I pulled a bunch of examples from Reddit. And so like on my buzz, you can see like I posted a bunch of these up and people had to reply to them and like a couple of them have actually replied like we can see some people's replies right here <sighs> well y'all it is 10 54 which means I think it is time for me to get off of the YouTubes and go do some of my other work. I have like a bunch of grading I have to do apparently. Um, yeah. 
So English 10 folk for you out there, if you haven't done your response yet, make sure that you come up here and do your response. Remember to follow the directions so that way you can get credit for that. Yeah. I'll be back on a little bit later today to do some Voices of Color live streaming. And I might also do some more writing today because I'm kind of in a writing mood lately. But thank you folks for tuning into the stream and awesome. I'll see you, John. And also, thank you for watching this if you're watching it after the fact. I will see you all later.